Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, today, I am pleased to introduce three speakers, Professors Wang Dazuo and Raman Azari from Penn State and Dr. Zhajian Ling from the Renewable Energy Laboratory, who will be speaking from online. Hopefully, Zhajian is out there. Um, all three are leaders in the buildings and energy element of the Baltimore Social Environment Collaborative, which is where I know them from. Raman is an associate professor of architecture and director of the Resource and Energy Efficiency Lab at Penn State. And for students, I think this is interesting to hear what the degrees of these folks are because they're different sometimes than what we're used to. He has a, earned a PhD in built environment, parentheses, sustainability track in 2013 from the University of Washington in Seattle. And I think I ran across Raman first from discussions with Lisa Ayulo. So this is another note for students. A lot of these relationships where you learn who people are and who might talk and help about something, it's a lot of the personal work. I mean, you, not often that you look up on the website and go, who, who should we find? Um, just for that note. Wang Da is a professor of architectural engineering at Penn State and associate director for the research for the global build research associate director for research for the global building network. He holds a joint appointment, interesting title at the Communities and Urban Science Group at NREL. Um, and I think Esther Obanio pointed me towards Wang Da. You heard Esther earlier this semester. And Wang Da and I had a great conversation before he moved to Penn State, where he I was very glad to hear about his interest in interdisciplinary research. And I wouldn't just call it interest, uh, more like effervescent enthusiasm. He's very enthusiastic for this. And then Wang Da said, hey, by the way, we have a colleague, Dr. Jia, Jia Ling, research engineer in the commercial building research group within the Building Technologies and Science Center at NREL. And Dr. Ling was part of, this is another interesting title, the team that was awarded the 2021 Peter Ritter von Rittinger International Heat Pump Award. I don't know exactly what that is, but it sounds pretty cool. Um, so this is a folks who do things that we do not all know, which is what we're up, up to learn about. So it's great to have this distinguished team to talk with us today about buildings, a critical element of urban science and climate change mitigation and adaptation. And they will discuss carbon emissions trading and building retrofits. And I think Wang does it first. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Kim, for the invitation. Uh, really glad to have opportunity to introduce our research uh, to the students here. I understand that not all of you are working on building in <laughs> building industry. Therefore, we're trying to stay on, on the talk on a high level, to give you some ideas on the things we are doing and opportunities in this domain. So we have three speakers. We're trying to do everyone 15 minutes, then we will some time at the end for your question and answers. So uh, my talk is trying to discuss how we can play, you know, the carbon trading um, scheme in the building ritual phase to promote sustainability, but also consider economic impact. Okay, as we know, um, buildings are really important because it consumes huge amount of energy and also responsible for a large portion of CO2 emission. As you can see, this is the data of global energy consumption. So buildings count for almost one third of energy consumption and the CO2 emission in the world. Therefore, if we want to reduce carbon emission, we want to address climate change problem, we need to work on buildings. So actually people have been working on building energy uh, efficiency for many years. Um, so in the past, we tend to focus on lighting, really replace the inefficient lighting with more efficient LED lights. We're also trying to do more energy efficient uh, refrigeration systems and other things. So the fitting point is trying to tell the building owners by doing energy efficiency, you're able to reduce the cost, right? So you give economic incentive, incentive to people. Now we talk about carbon emission reduction, right? So the trick is that how can we include a carbon emission reduction also in this loop so that we not only reduce energy carbon, but also bring the economic benefits. Okay, so here we're, I, I'm talking about large scale implementation to make a real societal problem. Right? You have to let people see the money, see the savings, right? then they will do it. So you can, you can find some few you know, uh, pioneers want to do you know, some um, sustainability project 
but to convince the majority, you need to show them the cost and the benefits. So carbon emission trading schemes. Anyone heard of this? Raise your hands. Okay, some, the idea is that, in, no, we want to reduce carbon emission, right? So uh, the government or some association will define, let's say, Kim, you get a 100 ton CO2 emission this year. And Wanda, you get 100 tons. But Ken is doing a much better job. He only needs 50 tons this year. But I did a good job. I need 150 tons. Now I bypass my quota. I need to find the 50 tons. I know Ken has additional 50 tons. I'm going to pay him money to get his 50 tons. We do trading. So that I am OK with my 150 tons and can make actual money. So by doing this, now we can encourage more people like Ken to save emission because they can have economic benefits. We also penalize people like me to use more carbon. Right? So that's carbon trading schemes. OK, there's a lot of uh, ETS or carbon trading schemes available in the world now. European Union is the largest uh, market here. So you can see the price of the carbon is about 50 US dollar per ton. And so places like California, they also start to do that, but at a lower price. And also a lot of countries and <clears throat> regions, they're also trying to implement the ETS. So you can see many of them are in the plan. So what are we trying to do here is that, can we you know, have good owners to get the, you know, the ETS credits, right? So that to incentivize them to do more building retrofits. To do that, it becomes a very interesting economic problem, even I'm engineers. And so first we need to understand what is the building retrofit investment? How much capital you have to invest when you retrofit the building? And then you calculate how much money you're gonna save from energy savings without participating in the ETS then how much additional saving you get if you participate in, in the ETS, the trading scheme. And then when you get all the information, then you can do analysis, right? The current impact without ETS, with ETS, then you can justify what is the economic impact if you participate in ETS. So that's the entire research methodology. So our research is actually a joint project with a professor from business school because he knows money. So we know <laughs> engineering facts. First, we're trying to identify what kind of regional freedom measure we can do, right? So, for example, you could increase insulation of the uh, building wall or roof, you can replace window, you can do lighting, many, many other things. And then here we try the different locations, trying to evaluate impact you know, at different climate zones. After that, we're trying to use the construction data to understand what is the capital investment if you do different building retrofits. As you can see clearly, replace window costs the most, right? So here we, we use the retrofit of medium sized office building as example. And then also the cost varies depending on location. As you can see here, this one is San Diego. So California is super expensive. So even doing the same retrofit costs more money in California. So that will give our idea of different cost of different measures at different locations. Next step, then we use beauty energy modeling, basically the models to predict the energy savings if you do different efficiency measure. And then we can calculate the energy reduction, right? But at different locations, at a different measure. For example, if you see the left figure, and so the highest one, here is actually doing the equipment. So and then you can say about 10% of energy. And also the reduction, highest one you get from San Diego. And so we know, you know add insulation to the building wall is great, but you can see the saving is relatively small, which, but it has a very high capital investment. The right figure shows the carbon emission reduction. So in general, reduce energy, you can reduce emission. However, this is not proportional. It really depends on your, the, um, the carbon intensity of electricity of your region. So for example, you can see here the greater force. Um, so you have high reduction 
uh, energy, but you have relatively low reduction in terms of CO2 emission. The reason is that in this region, the electricity largely comes from hydro dam. It's clean energy, right? Zero carbon. Therefore, reducing energy consumption does not really reduce CO2 emission because you already have clean energy. So if your goal is trying to reduce CO2 emission, then you should find the state where the electricity largely comes from fossil fuel. That you have large savings in terms of CO2 emission. Another impact factor is future, right? Because when we predict this, we need to predict next 20, 30 years. And then the emission factor is changing over, over the time. As you can see, this figure, what are, it shows that different, different cities in the column. And the, the role is the different scenario of renewable energy adoption. So the top one is called high renewable cost. That means renewable energy is very expensive. Then the adoption of renewable energy is slow. That means the power grid will replace those fossil fuel at a slow pace. The lower one is low renewable energy costs. That means people will accelerate the adoption because renewable energy is much cheaper than the fossil fuel. So in those different scenarios, you can see the percentage of our electricity come from clean energy is different, the total trend. And then that will lead the, um, the carbon emission reduction in the long term change at a different rate. The general trend, you can see that in general for all the locations, if you reduce the same amount of energy, the amount of the emission you reduce is decreasing. It's because of our electricity grid is become greener and greener, right? So have less carbon embedded in our electricities. And another trend is that at a certain location, for example, in Colorado, Denver, because electricity is largely come from coal-fired power plants, Therefore, you get a much higher CO2 emission reductions by, saving, by reduced energy from uh, Colorado. Okay, now, next, we know that the energy reduction, we know the carbon reduction, but we need to predict the price, right? The price is also a very interesting problem. And so here we build a you know, mathematical model by you know, learning from the historic data, as you can see from the green part, then we predict Future price, okay. I would say this is a prediction. If I know the price, I can go to trading, so I can make a lot of money. <laughs> so, and here to trying to estimate what's going to be the price for the future for our electricity, for natural gas, and for the carbon uh, emission. So now we have everything. We can calculate the cost saving. So first we calculate the cost saving without energy trading. So you now electricity price times the amount of electricity you save. Natural gas price times the natural gas you save, so you get the total money. And then there's another one called money uh, discount. The idea is that we know the inflation is happening, right? You say $100 today, maybe only worth $95 next year because of inflation. So as I see, the money you're able to reduce actually is going down over time. And then you can also calculate the cost saving with the carbon emission trading scheme. So basically, is emission factor, the amount of emission you save, times the price of the carbon. Then you can get additional savings from participating the ETS. Okay, what do we can see here? The cost saving brought by the building retrofits is largely, you know, change depending on what kind of price of the ETS you have. So first, Okay, let's look at the left figure. The lighting definitely brings a huge amount of saving. That's why in the building industry, when you do building retrofits, retrofit lighting system is always the first thing people do because quick and save a lot of money. And another thing is really depends on location. Again, so in this case, you say you know, the high saving come from California because they have high energy price. Even the capital cost is higher than other place, but the electricity price is significantly higher than other city. Therefore, it makes a lot of sense. And then the second figure and the third figure shows when you add those ETS, the, the dashed region, now you can see if the carbon price from $10 per ton to $100 per ton, you can add additional up to 37, 38% additional savings. Okay, so 
this is engineering calculation. Now let's do more complex calculation you know, using the Venus model. Uh, first, we, we use is called a continuous payback period. So the idea is that I did my initial investment. I spent $100. Uh, every month, I can save $10. Consider also the, the inflation. Then how long it takes for me to get my $100 back? How many months is? That's my continuous payback period. The simple way to explain the concept. Right? I want this period as short as possible. Right? Hopefully tomorrow I can get my investment back. Another one is return on investment. That's all the net profit from my ritual phase divided by cost investment. For example, I replace my light bubble. I spend $100. I can save $10 per month, but the light bubble can last 30 months. Basically, 30 times 10 is $300. Right? So then my net profit is 300 divided by 10, three times. So that's a good deal for me. OK, so first is our relative reduction of payback period. So here we plot the different regions and, with, and also different measure. And you will see we don't have plots for all the regions because of, for this one, the roof, the payback period is more than 20 years. Therefore, we, we do not plot it. So we only plot the payback period is less than 20 years in this figure. And then we can see that, for example, um, first, the carbon price significantly impact you know, the, uh, the, the reduction of the payback period. The solid triangle is the price at $10 per ton, and to the uh, solid circle is $100 per ton. So you can see when the carbon price goes up, we can all the way you know, in, um, to um, reduce our payback period to about 30 percentage. And also, the reduction also highly depends on locations. Um, for example, if you see um, the equipment, this is for appliance, and it works the best in the Danfo area because, again, Danfo has a lot of coal in generation, which you know, can give uh, us a lot of benefits for trading. So the next one is the um, relative increase of uh, return on investment. OK. so. Um, that's a similar trend. So by doing the um, the carbon trading, you know, when, when the price is low, we, we typically increase our return on investment about five percentage. But if the price go, goes to about a hundred dollar per ton, you can really increase the ROI about fifty percentage. Huge economic impact. So, for example, in the future, if you come to the field, if you want to convince the owner to do building retrofit, this is a way to you know to give them additional economic incentive. So to make the project feasible. So um, as conclusion, uh, we found that you know if the building is able to participate in the carbon trading, you know, it will receive you know, really significant positive um, incentive um, in terms of in economics. And of course, the calculation of this economic impact highly depends on many factors. For example, the carbon price, energy price, right, retrofit cost, climate, and many other facts. So therefore. We will need engineers working with you know, the, the business professionals to do the modeling calculations so that we can do better predictions. So and this work um, are based on the PhD thesis of my student Ying Li. Um, so I, I share the first paper with you, and then the other work is also you know, like modeling and the, the, the price prediction are, are, are the other papers. So uh, this research is funded by the National Science Foundation. And you can find more information of our projects through this link, or you can scan the QR code. So that's my contact information. If you have any other questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Rahman Azari. I'm an associate professor of architecture, and uh, I also run a resource and energy efficiency lab in the Department of Architecture and Inheimer Center for Community Design. And I'm also an affiliate associate professor of architectural engineering. So uh, I'm going to talk primarily about uh, carbon emissions and urban morphology. So uh, the RE2 lab consists of several PhD students, MS students, and the postdoc uh, scholar. And we do research at different scales of building skin, building, and city. 
I used to refer to city scale as large scale, but today I had a conversation with Nick, uh, one of the Kansas students during the launch, and I realized that you folks in EMS consider urban scale as micro scale. We consider it as large scale, basically. So a question that I oftentimes am asked is why cities and why buildings? Why do we need to research on this? And I could answer that with eight facts. One is that cities cover three, less, a little bit less than 3% of the Earth's land. Cities currently incorporate 57% of the world's population, but that is expected to rise to 68% by 2050 in certain parts of the world, in developed world, that is going to rise to 80%. In developing world, that is going to be around 52%. Cities consume 60 to 80% of the global energy. Cities emit 75% of the global CO2 emissions. And uh, buildings is a big part of the problem. The cities, because cities experience urban heat island, as I'm sure you're aware of, which affects the building energy consumption. And then because of the effect on building energy consumption, CO2 emissions are affected, and then a feedback loop is created, then UHI is going to be exacerbated because of the global warming. And this, I looked up in this the interesting research about the effects of urban heat island on building energy consumption, and there is a lot of different research and studies on this area. And the type of figures that they provide us is that the uh, urban heat island increases cooling energy consumption between 10 to 120 uh, percent. In average, in the US, that's uh, going to increase 17 percent, uh, which I, uh, increases uh, energy cooling energy consumption by 17 percent, but UHI also decreases heating energy demand of the building uh, between 3% to 44%, depending on geographical region. The sixth fact is that building and construction are responsible for at least 37% of the global GHG emission. 27% of that uh, is because of the energy consumption, uh, what we call it operational carbon, and there is an additional 10% that is because of the upfront embodied carbon or the emissions because of the manufacturing of the construction materials and all of the construction activities that lead to greenhouse gas emissions. And this is primarily because of, this 10% is because of five materials, concrete, steel, aluminum, glass, and brick that causes 10% of global GHG emissions. So the fact number, oh, Still, number six is that if we compare the emissions in 2022, which was which globally we had 36.8 billion metric ton of CO2, and compare it with the year before, that was 36.5, and this is only energy-related global GHG emissions. We see that there is a little bit less than one percent increase, or about 321 uh, metric ton, and of that. 60 or 20, about 20% 20 of increase in global em, uh, emissions was because of the increase in cooling and heating demand from extreme weather. So in other words, the part of it is because of this increased energy consumption because of the extreme weather. It's mostly, most of that 20% is because of the cooling and about a third of that is because of the increased heating demand. Number Seven, of course, there is an urgency to immediately and significantly limit the global GHG emissions. I borrowed this diagram from IPCC report in which it suggests that if we have no climate policy, we're going to have very high emissions. It's going to translate to about up to five degree Celsius increase in global warming. And if we take a 1.5 degree Celsius pathway policy, that would be achieved only with high net negative CO2 emissions. So not net negative, high net negative CO2 emissions is the status that we have to try to, to reach. And the fact number eight is that 38% of the U.S. households experience high or severe energy burden. Energy burden is a metric for energy poverty. It's uh, 
about the percentage of income that is spent on utility bills. If you spend more than 6% of your income on utility bills, that is called high energy burden. If you must spend more than 10%, that is called severe energy burden. And energy poverty is caused by three factors, combined effect of three factors, high energy prices, low income, and low building energy efficiency. So building energy efficiency is a big part of this equation. And of course, energy poverty affects a wide range of issues from comfort and health of the occupants to education, to economy, to environment, to inclusion, food deprivation, and you mentioned it. Uh, and we have one PhD student, Arjun Janardhanan, who is now doing research uh, in this area and the relationship between energy poverty and building energy efficiency in the context of Baltimore. So I think these eight facts perhaps uh, to some extent explains why we need to do research on urban buildings, but these eight facts might, might not be uh, comprehensive. Please feel free to let me know if you could mention other facts that could be added to the list. And if we, look at, if we go back to history and look at all of these key scholars and interesting people who have been warning us in the past 200 years or so about the impacts that we make on the environment. It could start from uh, Thomas Malthus, who was very concerned about the gr rising global population and whether or not we have enough food resources to provide the population with to the William Jevons, uh, uh, to uh, Erich uh, and his colleagues who developed the IPAT equation you probably are familiar with, to Yuichi Kaya, who developed this, the, this equation to explain the CO2 emissions of every society as a, a product of population, GDP per capita, uh, energy intensity and carbon intensity, to uh, Johan Rockestrom, who developed this concept of planetary boundaries. So all of these amazing people have been telling us about uh, the impacts that we make the environment and have been helping us to model and communicate and measure the impacts that we make on the environment. So the current status is that we live in cities that are climate change prone. Uh, we, have, we experience high energy use, we have high carbon emissions, we are not resilient, we are experiencing uh, energy poverty, but we want to move toward equitable climate change resilient cities that we don't have any of those problems. It's going to be net zero energy, ideally net zero carbon resilient energy uh, equity, and a sig significant transformations must be happening in order for us to achieve uh, that, tra uh, the, that transition. GHG emissions, energy, materials and resources, equity, costs, and you could add to that by mentioning air quality and all of these amazing research that BSEC project scholars are doing. So these issues are interconnected, are complex, and uh, a lot of barriers or opportunities are there that we must resolve from data to, the, to policy, to finance, culture, etc. I was reading this article that was mentioning that most of these barriers tend to be around the issues of data and political leaderships, lack of data and lack of political leadership and finance. So a knowledge gap that we are concerned in my group is, uh, at least in part of my group, is about the fact that building sector in major cities is a large undefined carbon source and limited understanding exists as to how urban morphology, densification, and decarbonization policies affect embodied and operational carbon emissions of cities and built environments. Uh, part of this problem is that we have, when we have increasing urban population, we have increasing demand in construction. So 230 billion square meter of new building construction is needed globally by 2060, according to United Nations. And there's a lot of other figures with regard to uh, the importance of demand and the, the fact that we need to address the demand. But then we have been trying historically to address demand by efficiency. In other words, if you have a building that is more efficient, then perhaps that is going to consume lesser energy and it's going to be perfect. But, and then if we look at the energy code in the past uh, uh, a few decades, since 1975, that uh, we started to have the first energy code in 1975 
we see that the building code in both residential and commercial sector has become much, much more stringent. And therefore, buildings that new buildings that we built today is much more efficient compared with the building that was built in 1975, uh, which is great. So that is a, a measure of efficiency by adding insulation, by adding a lot of uh, high performance window system, et cetera. But the problem also is that the demand has been increasing. The population has been increasing. The, therefore, the US residential sector and commercial sector has been uh, growing. And oftentimes, we see that there is not much savings at the, in the energy consumption of the building sector in the United States. So if we try to just simply estimate how much new building construction we're going to need in the United States by 2050, that uh, a simplistic estimation could uh, make it to about 9.7 billion a square meter, which is about 104.5 billion a square foot of new construction that is needed by 2050 in the United States. And that is going to be added to 34.8 billion a square meter of existing building stock. So you not only have to improve your existing building stock, but we're going to add new construction, uh, and that is significant amount of construction that we're going to need. So uh, I'm going to just briefly report on one work in progress that uh, we are doing. This is a work that is funded by Council on Tall Building and Urban Habitat. And in this work, we are trying to understand how urban form affects uh, uh, carbon emission. And with, if we build certain neighborhood up to the maximum level that the code uh, allows us, the building codes and zoning codes in cities would allow us, then what would happen with regard to the carbon emissions because of the energy consumption and because of the material consumption that you're going to have. And this is, a, uh, in this project, uh, Arjun Janardhan, the student that I mentioned is helping me. So. What we have been doing in terms of the methodology is that uh, we're, simply speaking, we're going to take the urban model uh, and then in order to simulate the a certain urban environment, you need certain types of information. One type of information is geometrical information. So you need to know, for example, the height of the building, the dimensions of the building. Uh, you need to know what is, uh, how much window you're going to have in your building certain parts of information are non-geometrical. You need to know what are the materials that actually are used in buildings. So it's a very data intensive process. You have to have a lot of data. Oftentimes, this data is not available to you. So you have to find a good way of uh, developing building stocks, what we call it building stock modeling. And there are different ways of doing building stock modeling, a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach. In bottom-up approach, you're basically going to assume that you have the information or going to find the information for every building in your urban neighborhood or your city that is going to need a lot of data, of course. In bottom-up approach, we're going to assume that, okay, this neighborhood that I'm working on is going to consist of X number of buildings, X type of buildings. For example, in this neighborhood, I'm going to have 20 types of buildings. And for each type, I know that what is their share in the neighborhood. For example, building type one is going to be uh, the 20% of the neighborhood, or building type two is going to be 30% of the neighborhood. And based on that, we're going to develop building a stock model. So there are these two different ways. And then uh, we have different software in order to uh, use uh, for energy simulation and for embodied carbon modeling. The software that we used, uh, urban building energy modeling through UMI. This is, these are the, uh, some of grasshopper and rhino based modeling software that we use. And that gives us energy use model based on the, the, some of the templates uh, uh, that is done through another software, uh, Energy Plus. The problem here is that if you, that gives us how much energy uh, basically you're going to need for your neighborhood. If you uh, compare the baseline scenario with scenario number one, where you built up to a certain level, and then scenario number two, where you increase your, the height of your building, scenario number 20, that would be the maximum height of the building. So you're going to use energy simulation to get the results uh, uh, for the energy use, but 
what about the carbon emission because of the construction material? That is going to be a very challenging process because of data availability issues. In other words, you have to know oftentimes the materials for every building or if not for every archetype of the buildings, you have to know what are the materials like. So we use in this project a very simplified process that basically we assume that, okay, so these type of nationally and globally different types of buildings of different heights uh, have different uh, uh, carbon emission intensity because of their construction. So we multiplied basically the number of floor area of those buildings by their carbon intensity to get what is their embodied carbon. And then we add it to the carbon emission because of the energy consumption of the building. And I'm not going to bore you with the results of different scenarios of uh, uh, urban form uh, that was assumed in that neighborhood in New York and what was the, the results in terms of both operational carbon, embodied carbon, but we were trying this project, we are still trying to refine methodology in order to capture density with better metrics. In this project, we use floor area ratio as the metric for density of the neighborhood. There are other metrics as well. And then we try to relate floor area ratio with the, as I mentioned, embodied carbon and operational uh, carbon. With regard to in operational energy and operational carbon, we notice that things are much more clear if you increase the floor area ratio of your building, of your neighborhood, linearly, you're going to increase operational energy consumption of the building. However, if you try to uh, increase the floor area ratio, then there is a sweet point after which the, 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 there is a shift in the a slope of the, uh, the increase in embodied carbon. In other words, maybe seven as the floor area ratio is that sweet point. And when I say floor area ratio, floor area ratio is the ratio of the floor area of all of the buildings in that neighborhood divided by their lot sizes. So for example, if you have uh, one building, let's say, pretend that this is one building that is covering one so lot. And if it's completely covering the lot, that would be floor area ratio of one. Then uh, if I make this building half and add this half on top of this, I still have the same floor area, right? But the lot size here would be the same, right? Floor area ratio is uh, still uh, one. So the ratio of, of all of the floor area by the, uh, the, the lot size. For the same lot size, if you want to have higher floor area ratio, you have to go higher, right? So that is the measure of the density and measure of the compactness of your urban environment. So according to our research, seven as the floor area ratio is that sweet point after which you're going to significantly increase your embodied carbon. So that is, uh, I think, pretty much what I had. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer. My name is Jajan, I'm a senior research engineer at Unreal. Um, the topic today I have is building energy performance prediction for Baltimore urban system facing climate change challenges. As Ken mentioned, the three speakers here are all involved in BSEC project. Um, what I really want to um, discuss here is in this application, talk about a hybrid modeling method to conduct building energy simulation in community level. Uh, Little bit of background here. Um, when we talk about building energy modeling, what we really care is two case, uh, two aspects. One is load, one is capacity. Load include conduct heat transfer calculation between ambient outside to the building. That's including heat convection, heat radiation, heat conduction via opaque walls, via windows, via roof or attics. In summer, heat typically add to the building. So you have creates a cooling load. In winter, heat reject to the ambient, causing a, a heating load. Um, on the other side, you have HVAC equipment, whether it's air conditioners or heat pumps provide cooling in summer, provide heating in winter or furnace in this case. Now, very simple, when demand equals to, when the load or demand equals to the capacity, then the room temperature keeps constant. Otherwise, it warrants a thermostat 
to control the on and off of HVAC equipment. So all these things fall into the domain of building energy modeling. Um, there, as you can see here already, uh, the process is purely physics-based. So there are existing formulations, knowledge to physically represent everything. But there are so many aspects of uh, components uh, involved in the building energy simulation. You need to have a air conditioning model, you need to have a heat pump model, or you have an envelope model to characterize what's the wall insulation look like, what the roof insulation look like. So typically when we talk about single building energy modeling, it can have, it requires a huge amount of data. Uh, Raman already mentioned a software tool called Energy, software tool called energy Plus, which is sponsored and maintained by DOE Building Technology Office. Energy Plus is almost the go-to tool for you to conduct single energy, building energy modeling. But there are so many inputs required, it almost warrants a set of other tools just to streamline the input process. Rhino or uh, Butterflies is kind of too, uh, Rahman probably mentioned, and then there's Open Studio also do similar things. Um, the real issue is for this project is how we scale up this kind of modeling into community level. Now in a community, we have 100 to 1000 buildings. How we get all the data to represent each building and then find out a way to simulate the same time. Now community is only one scale here. If we move all the way to the right, how are we gonna model every building in a city, in a nation? On our top level, at least Enrio decide or think, many researchers in Enrio think, it is, it is not realistic to model every single building in this world in an accurate manner. What we try to strive here is to model large scale of buildings that are statistically representable. Um, in the concept of, apply this concept to Baltimore area. If we want to model 1000 buildings in a neighborhood in Baltimore, we create 1000 building models, but there's no one-to-one -one resemblance between the model to the actual building. What we strive for is when we model those 1000 buildings together, the energy consumption, the load estimation will somehow match with the aggregate value we have from utility data of this 1000 data, of this 1000 buildings. So the hybrid method I want to introduce here is really a way to achieve those. Um, when we say hybrid, it divided into two. One is the statistic method. The other is physics-based method. There are all sorts of building surveys. EIA, Rex, which is, I have the background here, give me one second. <laughs> it is called a Residential Energy Consumption Survey conducted by US Energy Information Administration. And then there's US sensor data from American Housing Survey, US sensor data, American Community Survey. Um, all these describe certain characteristics of the building, real buildings. They get included into all these surveys. What we want to do at the first step is really mapping all these characteristics in a data structure. One example I show here is to create archetype parameters and this depending parameters. By archetype here, it's really about two um, very important uh, parameter. One is census division, the other is vintage. By census division, it's really about location, where this building located. And the vintage is really about when and when this building uh, get built. Uh, these two parameters compared with others are really easier to, to obtain. Now, with those archetypes, then downstream connected all sorts of housing characteristics that is important to be input into Energy Plus or any other building energy models. As one example here, if we know this building is in mid-Atlantic region, and then we know this building is built around 1980s, then all the heating fields, seating, insulations, and others will have such distribution, which again is from this survey data. For example, if we know in, it's the 1980s mid-Atlantic houses, residential houses, it has 49% of a chance that it is driven 
by natural gas to provide heat. And then among this 49% natural gas driven heating devices, 92, sorry, 25%, maybe certain 92.5 percentage efficiency, and then 5%, maybe only 60% of efficiency. I'm referring to the natural gas heating efficiency bracket here. Similarly, we can have all sorts of distribution about its seeding uh, insulation material, wall insulation material, and so on and so forth. So with this data structure, we only need to know two very obvious characteristics. So I can have all the corresponding underlying housing characteristics that uh, fulfill these two uh, archetypes. So the next question is really, now if we want to build 1,000 of buildings in this particular mid-Atlantic region, and then what do we do to create 1,000 samples that can statistically represent um, the actual buildings uh, on site. Um, you know, as I said, we need lots of information here, attic, um, insulation materials, whether it's R30 or R19 or R13 or R19 or R30, what are the wall we need, whether it's I19 or R0, um, how we can create those samples utilizing the survey data I just introduced. Uh, one method of doing that is using lighting hypercube sampling. Now let's transfer the distribution of certain housing characters into bracket and then assign certain value range to it. Now, if it is a 1950 building in mid Atlantic region, we assign, because it's 11% also will be using attic insulation material R0. So assign being number between one to 11, so on and so forth, you know, I will assign 8% of the buildings using R38 attic material, which will have the number of 93 to 100, so on and so forth for other um, housing characteristics, characteristics. Now, if I have 100 buildings, I just need to use random generator to assign 100 random data to these buildings. And then using this uh, Latin hypercube intervals, I can create 100 buildings that supposed to be um, statistically representable of this region. But again, of course, the higher the number of sampling, the more statistically representable of a ensemble of buildings characters I can create. It's again a trade-off of how much computation power you have and then how much accuracy you want to, you want to have. Um, that was the statistic driven part, data driven part. Now, you know, the physics part is really um, more straightforward. Um, you know, you have buildings, you have different zones. Zone can be in residential buildings. It can be living room, bedroom, bathroom, kitchen. Of course, we need to divide that building into these structures. And then talking about each zone will have this individual surface materials, and then it will have certain um, orientations of the wall, and then how many windows. Gather all this information from the previous uh, statistics-driven method, and then we can start to building the building envelope that re requires the next step, required by next step to conduct um, energy transfer calculation, heat transfer energy, uh, calculation. Similarly, we will um, establish a mixed air system, which essentially how the air flow network flow from ambient to the, to the inside, typically through ventilation, mechanical ventilation, as well as infiltration. So on the left, we talk about potential heat radiation and the heat conduction process. And at the right, we really focus on heat convection process. Um, the load side, again, this is another specific example how we calculate radiation and convection via windows. But uh, that's not, um, I think, new because it's a well-known energy balance calculation. So these two take care of the low side calculation. And then we have a representation about your HVAC equipment. Um, as a general rule of thumb, your AC systems lose capacity when the ambient get hotter and hotter. And then so the energy consumption becomes more and more when the ambient get hotter and hotter. In winter case, of course, if you have a heat pump, you will quickly notice when the ambient is colder, then you pay more utility because your compressor need to work more. We have existing performance curve set that can well represent these characteristics. So quickly jumping into an example here, we take several buildings, 18 family houses, and then two commercial buildings in the 
Baltimore region called Edna Garden. And then we conduct this kind of community level simulation. Uh, example of the GeoJSON human readable um, characteristics that we get from the data, uh, statistic data driven method. And then we combine those with the physics modeling method to conduct the building level site EUI here is, is the energy use intensity, which is essentially the total energy used in a year of this building divided by the building footprint. So you can see um, there's a baseline cases that, and then there's a, a high efficiency cases, baseline cases we divide into the residential uh, 18 buildings and also the two commercial buildings. Of course, the energy consumption in this case dominate by these two uh, commercial buildings. The high efficiency example here, we focus on really how to uh, improve the building insulation by 20% and then our appliances become 10% more efficient. We haven't touched the HVAC part of it. Um, HVAC we expect can provide more energy savings in these two cases. But again, because of time, I'm gonna quickly skip that, um, the detailed analysis. Um, another aspect of things we did with the Enrio for this project is to apply certain models to represent future um, ambient temperature profile. Um, typically right now we have using TMOI called a typical meteorology year data, but that was almost outdated. There are existing models using IPCC predictions to say what the weather forecast will look like in the future, 2040, 2050. And then we apply those um, temperature models and then conduct analysis to see how this impact with the HVAC sizing and then how it's potentially impact energy consumptions um, as well as um, carbon emissions. So because of time, I wanna quickly conclude my talk here and then leave enough time for questions. Thank you. Yes, I see Elliot's hand up. Um, a question is for Zha Zhen. Um, it, towards the end of your talk, um, I know you're rushing through some of the slides. Um, when, you, when you're alluding to the differences um, with the IPCC runs and the typical meteorology year, I'm just curious roughly how sensitive um, those results are, such as a degree Kelvin um, affects, affects the energy by X amount. Yeah, so high level, we did two sides of calculations. One is to determine how, for example, the hottest day temperature increase in 2050 compared with existing TMOI3 data. Um, what I can see is from, because for, first of all, these are IPCC models. I think there are 16 of them. What we pick is the among the top um, aggressive assumptions. There are anywhere between three to four Kelvin increase um, in summer case. And then there is also four or five K increase in winter. So generally speaking, we require more energy in summer because AC need to work a little bit more. According to these models, we will have warm winter. So we may have, you know, we may uh, reduce the energy consumption from heat pump or furnace in winter case, assuming those models do their good job. So this is the conclusion I can give at this moment. Um, sorry, talk about energy use increase. I think it's around 10% annually. Um, HVAC sizing, we expect 5% also cooling. Um, your air conditioning probably need to be 5% larger than now to cope with the future weather. On the other hand, your heating coil may be up to 10 to 20% smaller just because of global warming. Does this answer your question? It does. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more online? Always come back. Let's check in the room here. All right, we've got a couple questions, and I'm not sure who it's for, but I have the second mic. Um, I have a question for the first speaker. When you were speaking on the sustainability for buildings, uh, you talked about like the fluorescent lights and energy efficient fridges, which made sense to me. But I was just curious on how you stated the triple pane window, but I didn't know exactly how that would affect overall like sustainability for a building on reducing carbon. 
Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so we talk about a triple pin window, for example, like you have single pin window, right? You might have more heat loss in the cold winter, but then you will use more energy to heat or more energy to cool in the summer. So by replacing that, you're able to reduce energy consumption. And then by reducing your energy consumption, you reduce the CO2 emission. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, all three of you, thank you for your talks. I uh, thought they were very interesting. Um, my question was for Raman, uh, just because I remember during the your talk, you were talking about the non-geometric simulations that you need to gather information for the buildings. And I was wondering if you could uh, restate briefly, if you can, the, uh, the top-down approach to that. Sure. Uh, so as I said, there are certain information from buildings that you would need for your modeling that uh, are non-geometrical. For example, what is the type of material that you're going to use for a structure of your building? Right now, probably these columns that you see in this room are perhaps concrete uh, the, the covered with uh, some wood covering. So we don't have that information for every building. If we want to know uh, if I build this building, how much uh, with concrete, how much would be the embodied carbon or the carbon emissions because of the construction of that. So oftentimes what we do is that based on uh, some of the, the probabilities, based on some of the information from American Housing Survey, for example, they tell us that, okay, so in single family, in new single family houses that were built in last year, I don't know, I'm making up completely, 80% of them were built with wood structure and 5% of them had brick cladding. So we're making those assumptions in order to build archetypes and then use archetypes in, uh, to uh, for basically embodied carbon modeling. Uh, thank you. Interesting talk. Uh, I just want to uh, comment on uh, your study. Uh, my recent uh, experience, I just moved from Maryland to uh, Penn State uh, about three months ago, and I I just felt the energy efficiency uh, in my apartment. So uh, you pointed that there are two important factors, location and the vintages. But in my experience, uh, at least in the same residential areas, the vintage is a dominant effect to the energy efficiency. Uh, when I compare my uh, the, uh, electri electricity and the gas bill, um, that is uh, previous my residential place. I paid five percent of my rent, but currently I uh, paid the uh, uh, rest time. Let me see. Uh, uh, previous my residential area, I paid two percent of my uh, rent, but currently I paid twenty percent of my rent. And then, but, but this is uh, just a winter, very very cold uh, season, and and specifically this uh, uh, areas, and but uh, absolute value is uh, my electricity and gas is uh, uh, five time a uh, factor of five uh, larger than uh, uh, previous uh, uh, my place. So I think uh, when you considering the same uh, uh, location, uh, same. Uh, type of uh, building uh, structure or areas, I think uh, uh, vintage or the age of a building is definitely a fact because the same time um, period, they have uh, uh, similar material available when they built uh, the, uh, their buildings. So uh, I think uh, uh, that's why they affect uh, everything just uh, <laughs> covered uh, those uh, um, efficiencies. Uh, absolutely. So vintage is one of the other criteria that is considered for archetype development. And I think Jia Zhen mentioned in his research that they used vintage uh, for basic archetype development. And yeah. if you would like to. Okay. I, I don't know if you refer to also my talk uh, because I mentioned location. So it, my location means California compared to Florida compared to Colorado, right? So that matters a lot, <laughs> you know, right? So um, so that's really you know, the, the heating dominated climate in dominant climate, right, mild climate, you have a huge difference in terms of energy consumptions. Um, so if you come to microclimate, 
it, it, you can see similar trend. We, we, we are doing some simulation right now to study the row house in Baltimore. So, you know, you think about the older row house in Baltimore, like 10 units like, connect together, right? What do we find that the end units, they have much higher energy consumption because exposed to the outside environment. The interior units, because you have a kind of neighborhood, right? Which can keep you heating or cooling. So therefore you have less exterior wall exposed to the environment. So even in the same building, the ones stay inside get better, you know, more, more efficient because of your neighbors. And if you think about a high rise floor, as Rahman mentioned, right, the different floors, then the people stay on the top floor tend to have higher energy consumption because it is exposed to the sun, sunshine directly. The people stay in the middle tend to have less energy consumption, right, in principle. So the, all, this also matters. And also where your building is facing. Are you facing the wind, cold wind directly? Are the boundary of your neighborhood? Or you're in the middle of your neighborhood, you have less cold wind exposure. So, you know, there's a lot of different factors. That's why we need building energy modeling to calculate those facts. That's you know all of our work. A question on model validation. I guess this would depend on model you use, but what do you do to actually validate a lot of the numbers that are coming out of your model? Is I feel like those information are probably really hard to get at too. Yes, you, you, you really point the right question. Um, so it's really easier to validate a model for individual building, right? You can just go to the building and measure data. So when you come to the largest scale modeling, uh, let's say our body model project, what we're trying to do is that number one, it's really difficult to validate every individual building. But we luckily, we're, we're working with the utility company. They are going to provide us the group data of those houses. So therefore, we are able to run the model, you know, large scale model for certain homes, then we will compare our predicted energy profile to the utility provided profile so that we say, oh yeah, for this community, our model is able to predict profile correctly. Um, so another way we do validation is you know, my, the project I mentioned. So we're working with uh, the Irish partner. So in Ireland, they have an energy certification for more than 5 million houses. So they send the energy auditor to your home to evaluate the energy of your home you know, from A all the way to F. So basically, by doing that, you get a sense of if your home is energy efficient or not. With the 5 million data points, it helps us to generate a model to see if my model match with your statistic data. Yeah. Anything you want to add? Any more questions? Oh, some question over there? That was that oh. was a comment from Ben Hobbs oh. a ways back, noting that uh, Great Falls, with the marginal source of electricity, except, uh, if there's going to be additional electricity, I think is what that means, if I interpret that correctly. Um, if, if you'd like, I can uh, comment. Yeah, sure. So, Go ahead, Ben. Marginal versus average emissions, and then short run marginal emissions from dispatching uh, the, uh, electric power plants versus long run emissions because uh, the mix is going to change and policies about building electrification will also change that mix. So there's a lot of uh, agonizing and hand wringing in the field about what marginal emissions to use from the, um, the, the ele electric power system short run or long run, and then should you account for the changes that uh, policies will make, um, they might make uh, renewables more attractive or less attractive. So I wonder if any of the speakers would like to talk about um, your preference when you use uh, marginal emissions from electricity production. Do you prefer short run dispatch marginal or long run marginal, or do you prefer average? The comment I made was that nobody is building more hydro plants. So really hydro production is fixed. So the marginal emissions in Great Falls are not uh, 
uh, low because you're going to get more hydropower. The uh, marginal emissions from Great Falls are actually pretty high because um, you're going to maybe life extend coal plants or you're going to be using um, you're going to be building more natural gas plants if you don't if you uh, um, electrify buildings. Um, any comments about that general issue? Yeah, I, I think that you asked a great question. Um, so we are not really experts on CO2 emission from e electric generation. So in our research, we mainly use an uh, area's camping database. Um, so that database really predict the, the, I think it's hourly uh, CO2 concentration from electricity generation at different state. And I believe they do consider all the potential effects as, as you showed you different scenarios, right? That really depends on the policy. For example, I, I saw the data for one state, I uh, know the CO2 emission is reducing all the time, and then suddenly the emission goes up. Uh, I was asking my student, what's going on? Why you see this kind of you know, abnormal? Then she dig out, she realized that uh, there's a nuclear power plant which is going to retire in 2040. And then, you know, in anyway's prediction, they assume they will have to use some natural gas or other resource to replace the nuclear power plant. Therefore, their CO2 emission of generation suddenly goes up. So you, I, I think they, they do have some dynamic, as you mentioned, they considered. But of course, again, there's a lot of uncertainty. Maybe the policymaker decide to extend the life of a nuclear plant or they want to build something right, more clean instead of natural gas power, power plants. I hope thank this answers your question. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's, uh, very, that, that's very helpful. That accounts for changing rates over time. And... Um, and um, I'm, I'm glad to see that that's accounted for. Um, the short run versus long run issue, I think is a very difficult one. The long run issue, you'd, one would have to somehow project how investment in different types of uh, electricity generation will change depending on whether the building sector, sector is electrified or not. And that's pretty speculative. Um, if we were trying to guess in 1970 what would have happened from 1970 to 2020, we would have been way off. And so we're probably going to be way off for the next 20 or 30 years too. Um, yeah, hopefully, yeah. There, hopefully there'll be good news and much cleaner and less expensive sources coming along. But it's <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Also, I just want to add one more comment. Also, very interesting finding that you know uh, common sense. Right, so in the hot afternoon, you want to reduce energy consumption to help power grid, correct? Right, because everyone is running AC in the summer. Think about that. But think about California, because they are adopting a lot of PV, renewable energy. In the afternoon, they produce more clean energy than they can consume. So they call a dark curve problem. So in that case, if you reduce your CO, you know, the air conditioning in the afternoon, you actually that not help reduce CO two emission because anyway it's come from clean energy, right? So spending money on the air conditioning to reduce the energy consumption in how to have no does not help at all in this case. So now it depends on your objective: do you want to save energy or do you want to reduce CO two emission? This may change our way of thinking for building rich phase in the future. Because more and more states are trying to do renewable energy. All right. I think it's time. Let's thank the speakers again and call it a day. Thank you. I, the recording, we will be posting the recordings. We're a little behind on getting them posted, but the recordings will be getting uh, made available. Possibly through the BSEC website also. Right now it's at a Penn State site. Or, yeah. We'll get them linked. Oh, sorry, we're behind. <laughs>